Praise the Lord. If not for Christ, we have nothing to sing about. Amen. Praise God, the Lamb forever. So appreciate this pre-service. And I believe the Lord's going to continue to move in this service. There's a strong, sometimes we say an undercurrent, but it's no undercurrent this morning. <laughs> Amen. The Lord is present amongst us. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Let, let me tell you this for a read. We've been in this series. I never intended it for it to continue. Just I had just a couple of sermons. But I've been preaching on the Bible is a reliable guide. And I wanted to begin this morning on the Bible is a reliable guide on how to live. And it started getting so big this week uh, when I was studying. I did what my wife many times has advised me to do, just start cutting it in half. And so I'm going to have to do this in installments. And because of that, I want to deal only with this this morning. I want to preach to you, and I really pray, this is maybe rhetorical, but I really pray your hearts will be open. I want to speak to us for our time, but I want to preach on the other half of grace. The other half of grace. The other half. Would you just say that with me? We don't do that much. The other half of grace. And let's read Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. I'm just going to tell you where we're pre what we're preaching this morning. The same grace that saved us when we were completely undeserving and unworthy, in spite of our past life, that grace that saves us, once we're saved, that grace teaches us how to live in the now and live in preparation for eternity. The grace that forgives us our past will also get us to heaven. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. How many heard me this morning? I said the same grace that forgave our past, it'll get us into our future. I want to preach on the other half of grace. Would you pray with me for me? Stretch forth a hand this way. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that's at work in this service. Lord, I pray that you'd move mightily amongst us. I pray, Lord, you would touch us, oh Lord, in a special way. God, in every aspect of our church, amongst the youth and the children, and on up, Lord, your Spirit is moving. God, we pray that you'd have your complete and total way this morning. God, anoint this preaching and both speaker and hearer in Jesus name we pray amen you can be seated I do want to mention before I begin to preach it was a thing I kept forgetting but this week via email I've been in correspondence to a listener in New Zealand and his last email he was just talking about as he streams the service or listens to the sermons in the archives he said I can just feel the anointing and God moving and speaking. And I'm glad for not only the ministry in, in the tech room, but your support of that. Those folks all over the world we're hearing from that are touched. And I said all that to say this. There are people that are truly hungry for the true worship and the true preaching of the word. I'm not saying we're, by any means we're the only place that does that. But we try to stick with this book around here. Amen. Amen. In both worship and life and expression. The other half of grace. I'm going to tell you this discreetly. I, I couldn't hardly believe it when I read it. But there's a group of married folks. They call themselves using a, a wicked terminology or a terminology for a wicked lifestyle. They call themselves swingers for Jesus. And they say their goal is, is to go around trading partners, even with those that aren't saved, so they can show the love of Jesus and to win people to Christ. Can you imagine? They're for real. In other words, they're serious about this. How perversely vile, how warped can that be? 
And yet I want you to consider, I'm not talking about being critical or judgmental. I want you to think of your world from youth on and and think of how many other professed Christians who are so invested and involved living carnally and worldly and doing Bible forbidden things and yet they will look at you and say, I am a Christian. How many knows exactly what I'm speaking of this morning? It's the world that we live in. How has it come to this? I know this is going to be simplistic, but I want to tell you how we've come to this where people profess to be Christians and live in wickedness and vileness. It has come to this because folks have perverted what it means to be saved by grace. That's how we've come to this. What is the response from the majority of church folks when they're told the Bible says you should live this way or the Bible says you shouldn't live that way? You begin to make those statements and preach that way. How do the majority of church folks respond? They respond by looking at you and saying, don't you know we're saved by grace? I've been there. Don't judge me. We're saved by grace. That is the reason that they give. I have discovered that when somebody starts saying, don't you know we're saved by grace, that has become a code phrase that means I may be a Christian, but I will live the way I want to live, and there's nobody going to tell me, no preacher, no youth pastor, there's nobody going to tell me how to live. How many remembers when saved by grace, when somebody said, I'm saved by grace, that used to mean my life's been changed by the power of Christ. How many remembers when saved by grace used to mean a changed life? Now saved by grace means I've got a free pass to heaven, but I can go on living however that I please. People who respond to the Christian message that Christians should live differently, when they begin to respond don't you know I'm saved by grace they say that they're honoring even though they're going on and living wickedly they say when I, I'm saved by grace and what I'm doing when I keep living wrong but claiming it's grace in my life I'm giving honor to grace I'm showing how powerful grace is I, 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 I'm giving attention and esteem to the grace of God when somebody says that I said no you're not that's already been tried amongst us New Christian, New Testament believers. Amen. You're, you're not giving honor to the grace of God by living like the world and saying I'm saved by grace. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Grace doesn't allow you to keep living in sin. Grace Grace gives you a power over sin so you don't have to live there. Amen. Since the grace of God is really that incredible to forgive us and to pardon us and even in spite of our undeservedness that grace is not an excuse to continue to live an old life. That grace compels us with hearts of gratitude to live devotedly sold out completely to the one who has saved us. Oh, if I'm saved by grace, I'm devoted to the one that saved me. If I'm saved by grace, I'm committed to the one that gave his life so I could be saved by grace. I want you to hear me across this building. Grace should never be used as an excuse to live worldly. Grace should be used as the reason to live holy and godly and soberly and righteously in this evil world. If I have truly let grace change my heart, my changed heart will have within it a driving desire to please God according to His Word. If I've really been saved by grace, there's something in me that will cry out, I just want to please the 
the Lord be in His will in every way, found in His likeness. Amen. It comes with grace. The more alarming thing isn't just that professed believers live any way they please. It's that they seemingly have no desire to serve God rather than their flesh in this world. I'm telling you, a saved person should never have to be told that his life should be different than that of the unsaved. A truly born again believer by the grace of God should never have to have anybody say to him there ought to be a change in the way you think, in the way you do, in the way you talk. Amen. If somebody's really got that grace, amen, there's something in them that says I want to live pleasing to him. That's what grace does. You say, well, I know professed Christians and they're not living according to the book. What's up? I know this sounds kind of categorical, but I believe it's true. Amen. If someone professes to be a Christian and they're not living a life different from this world, two things. Number one, they're not really born again. Nobody likes to hear that, but I'm going to tell you, amen, amen, it's true. Some folks can easily say, I'm a Christian, and down a beer. They can say, I'm a Christian, and light up a marijuana, amen, joint. They can say, I'm a Christian, and commit and commit impure sins, amen, that the Bible says, no one doing those things will enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, it's easy to profess it, but if there's not something in you that is repulsed by the sins of this world, you very well may have never been born. You say, I shook the preacher's hand, I got baptized in water, I read my Bible. Amen. That's not the same thing as being saved by grace. Being saved by grace changes your heart. There's a second possibility. Amen. Somebody really got saved and they were appreciative of it and they were thankful and they rejoiced in their salvation, but they've been listening to the wrong voice. It might have been a voice on religious radio. It might have been a voice of a peer. Amen. But they're listening to a voice that in the end is the voice of Satan that says you can go to heaven and continue to live the way you want to live. I don't know whom you may have heard that from, but that's not the voice of the Bible. That's not the voice of Christ. That's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That is a false, deceiving, errant, heretical spirit. I'm telling you, we're going to see in a moment. I'll tell you what grace will say. If you really got grace, grace will say live soberly. Grace will say live righteously. Grace will say they live godly looking for Jesus to come. Hallelujah. You see the glorious truth and Bible teaching of grace has been used by Christians as an alibi an excuse for not living pure. Amen. First of all, and I will be brief on these, but we got to get it. The first half of grace is the wonderful truth that God saves the undeserving. Oh, I'm glad I can preach grace. Notice what it says here, verse 11. The grace of God that bringeth salvation. You never went and got salvation. The grace of God brought it to you. Oh, come on, we could shout right there. How many members a day when the grace of God which bringeth salvation? Hallelujah. This is the first half of grace. Amen. You know, as I preach this, I realize something. Grace means nothing to the one who doesn't realize he needs saving. It means nothing. If you don't think you need saving, grace needs, means nothing. But I'm telling you, if you're here and there's someone here this morning, you say, you realize, I can't save myself. It doesn't matter what I do. It don't matter how hard I try. I can't save myself. If you're here this morning and you will say in honesty of heart, I don't deserve to be saved. There's nothing I can do to merit and earn it. And I am unworthy and I don't deserve to be saved. If you're here that way this morning, 
morning, I've got wonderful news. You can be saved because of grace. We are saved by grace, not by works. Thank God. I said, thank God. Amen. I, I don't care your name, your educational background, your financial status. From you, no matter how hard you work, no amount of self-effort, no amount of good deed doing, no amount of depriving yourself from worldly pleasure will ever save you or me. You see, we didn't just sin. We were sinners. We were born with sin. We neither earn nor deserve salvation. But we are saved by the unearned, unmerited, freely given favor of God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Grace is when God gives us what we do not deserve. I want you to notice something here. Oh, this is wonderful. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All men refuse, won't, won't be willing to see it. But I'm telling you, His grace is indiscriminate. It don't matter which neighborhood you live in. It don't matter which family you came from. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your past life. None of those things. Oh, His grace hath appeared to all men. Oh, hallelujah. That's why I can preach. All can be saved. All can be changed. Oh, hallelujah. I want to I wanna briefly revisit how I begun. Sometimes when you mention as a Christian, a preacher, or a teacher, that there's a way a Christian should live or shouldn't live, the reflex retort to that was, don't you know we're saved by grace and not by works? I've concluded something when somebody tells me that. Number one, that's supposed to make me look unspiritual or dumb or both. You know what I'm saying? You know, really, you know, a really Christian shouldn't be involved in that. Don't you know we're saved by grace? In other words, you're too unspiritual to really understand the grace of God, or you're just too dumb to get it. How many's ever got that feeling? When somebody says in re response, don't you know we're saved by grace? That's supposed to make you look like some heretic. And they'll put a label to it. A legalist. When someone says, don't you know we're saved by grace to justify their life? That's supposed to quieten you up. It's like when and I've had this happen. Somebody chooses to do something that's against the word of God. They'll look at me and say, well, I prayed about it. In other words, shut up. Don't say anything. I'm, you know, shouldn't be doing that. Don't you know I'm saved by grace? In other words, be quiet. Shut your mouth. Amen. When somebody says in response to some type of, of preaching, you know, Christians ought not to be involved in that. And when they say, don't you know we're saved by grace? That's supposed to justify anything they individually choose. But I want to make very clear when I preach on the grace of God, this first half, amen, we're not talking about getting saved. Amen. We're talking about living saved. There's only one way to get saved, and that's grace, 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 undeserved and unmerited. When we start talking about, amen, come out from the world, live righteous, live holy. We're not talking about getting saved. We're talking about living in a certain way because we are saved. We are born again. Amen. We don't live differently to be differently. We live differently because we are different. Our hearts been changed. Our minds been changed. Our Tensions, our affections have been changed. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you once again, I'm saved. I'm glad we're saved by grace. When somebody's stuck with that response, don't you know we're saved by grace? It shows me they've only gotten half the story about grace. It shows me they haven't heard, they haven't understood, or they haven't accepted the rest of the story about grace. Where's Paul Harvey when you need it? Some folks need the rest of the story. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Oh, I, I said hallelujah. Brother Wilson, he not only picks you up out of the muddy pit, he'll keep you out of the muddy pit. 
You believe that, Brother Cruz? He'll not only reach way, 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 way down, pick you out of the pit, but he don't let you just stumble back. And if you'll let him, he'll put your feet on a solid rock. You won't be going back to the pit. Glory to God. I said glory to God. It was grace when that father accepted that boy from the pig pen with the stench of pigs on him. But one thing I understand from the story, once the father accepted that unworthy son and the son realized it, he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a hired servant. Amen. He didn't deserve it for what he did. But the father by grace accepted him. But one thing I've noted in the story, that young boy, he never went back to the pig pen. He said, if my father has forgiven me, I'm not going back. What happened? He got the other half of grace. Let's look at the other half of grace. Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's the first half. Second half. Amen. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. We may have to toggle back and forth, but notice in verse 11, grace bringeth. Verse 12, grace teacheth. Let's do that again. Verse 11, grace bringeth salvation. Amen. Next verse, grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly Lust. I'm talking about the other half of grace. Listen, grace not only brings new life, grace teaches us how to live new life. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. The word teach means to train. It means to train. Amen. It trains two ways. It'll put a compulsion within. You get a hold of grace. Grace will say... That's good to do. That's not good to do. If you really got grace, it'll talk to you that way. I'm saved. Amen. I'm saved by grace. And grace will say, don't do that or do that. But not only does grace teach by putting the inward compulsion, but grace teaches by putting you in an environment. Even grace even will put you in a place where you can learn how to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Grace will give you models in your life that you can say there's a godly sister there's a godly brother I want to live godly life grace will give you teachers a a Sunday school teacher even somebody I'm telling you grace it'll teach you that's the other half of grace false or true doctrine about grace comes down to this how do you see the results of grace how do you imagine the results of grace I've heard it many times this week some from young people in personal conversations with me some from the preachers and different ones at the youth camp but I've heard several times this week people today don't want to be told how they should live and they're not talking about people lost out in the world they're talking about folks in church don't you know folks don't want to be told how to live today I tell you a generation in the church who will not be told how a Christian should live or not live. Amen. They're a generation who will not accept it from a teacher. They will not accept it from a preacher. They will not accept it from a pastor or a parent. Even yet in not accepting the way the Bible says they should live. In other words, they won't hear it from the preacher. They won't hear it from the Sunday school teacher. Amen. But in not accepting how the Bible's telling them how to live, they will accept how the world tells them how to live. Amen. They won't accept what a godly parent says. This is a way a Christian should live. But they will accept the way the ungodly peer says this is a way you should live your life. These are the choices that you should make. I'm telling you, it comes down to what teacher are we listening to. I tell you, we ought to be listening to grace. Why? Grace is what saved us. You can trust grace to teach you how to live righteously and godly in this present world. Amen. How many knows there's plenty teaching folks how to live ungodly? It's not by accident. Many of it's contrived and calculated to teach people to live ungodly. Amen. I want to tell you the majority of what's on television is a calculated effort to teach folks how to live with no snub to God, 
to live in violation to that book and to live according to the dictates of their fleshly minds and hearts. It's taught on television. It's taught even in the venues of schools. It's taught through the music. It's taught even through popular video games. If you would really just take a step back and say, what's that teaching? You'd come to one conclusion. It's teaching me how to live ungodly. It's teaching me how to say yes to my flesh and my carnal nature. Oh, but what does grace teach us? It teaches us. Do you see it right there? It teaches us to live soberly. It teaches us to live righteous. And soberly doesn't mean just keep away from the bottle. Soberly means to live with a serious mind about things and a self-discipline of life because you see how serious life and it teaches us to live righteousness and godliness. You say it don't seem much like much fun. Amen. That's not what Paul said. He said the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm telling you this is what grace teaches us. It isn't that we can't live the way we lived before grace found us. It's that we don't want to live that way anymore. Hallelujah. I've heard the old timers, forgive me, I couldn't come up with a a synonym quick enough, but but, but I've heard the old timers talk about Brother Vaughn many times testifying how he got saved. He said, I still drink all I want to drink. I still dance all I want to dance. I still smoke all I want. He said, I just don't want to anymore. I'm telling you, that's what grace does. Hallelujah. It's that we don't want to. Hallelujah. Amen. Christians that live carnally and worldly and sinful. Amen. There is a clear indication that they've not been listening to the teaching of grace. I know some folks, they take exception with me this morning. And they would say, you know what? It's just those hard-hearted, hard-headed holiness preachers that teach people how they ought to live. Don't you know, pastors, there's so many churches churches you can go to and they got a message of reaching your potential they got a message of becoming wealthy and prosperous and they'll never ever preach anything about how to live this way or not that the only ones that preach it are those hard-hearted hard-headed holiness folks i'm telling you that's a lie amen from satan himself i'll tell you who teaches us to live soberly and righteously it's grace not legalism oh that's just legalism it'll teach you there's one way to live and it'll, no it's not legalism grace am I reading the scripture right am I it's grace the work of grace in our hearts that incredible awesome grace of God teaches me how to live hallelujah hallelujah let me tell you something all this talk about grace saved by grace hallelujah for it but People talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk some more about being saved by grace. At some point, there's a time to quit talking about grace and let grace talk to us. And what's grace going to say? Am I reading it right? Why don't you just read that with me? Denying ungodliness and worldly like God, can I hear you? We should live soberly, righteously. And godly. Not in a commune somewhere out in Montana. We've all sold our stuff and we're living in a nuclear bubble so we won't know in this present world. Oh, we ought to get excited, right? When you really get grace, you can go into ungodly work, ungodly school, ungodly neighborhood, and you can live righteous right in the middle of it because of grace. Oh, I've got to move on. Amen. Amen. Any teaching that we're to live differently is really grace at work in our lives. Amen. If you're thankful for it when I say it, just say amen. Grace has given us a Bible. Grace has given us a church. Grace has given many godly parents. Grace has given us teachers. Grace has given us preachers and pastors. Grace has given us the guide of the Holy Spirit. 
Oh, hallelujah. Grace teaches. Amen. We're saved by grace. Listen to how different that sounds. It doesn't matter how we live. That's not only a totally wrong concept, but whoever's teaching that is an errant teacher or preacher deceived by false doctrine. They claim to still be Christians. Amen. Because some Christian friend, some preacher, some songwriter isolated one half of grace and said we're saved by I mean write a song about the other half I said write a song about the other half grace taught me how to live grace put holiness in my heart grace gave me a righteous thinking mind grace gave me pure thoughts grace gave me a desire to please the Lord amen write a song about the other half of grace amen I'll find a place to quit I'm trying to parcel this up I'll find a place to quit in a moment but this teaching that we hear so often in our church world I want you to ask a question how is that any different than the liberal teaching of our society the liberal teaching of our society says there's no standard of living that applies to everybody everybody should just be themselves everybody should just do what here here it is do what you got to do follow your heart amen find out what you want and do that amen what is the end result of that kind of thinking I'll tell you what it is and I rarely mention names but it's in the news and I want to make a point with it amen when you start telling people there's no absolute standard there's no principles you just follow your heart you be an individual and do whatever you want to do what's the end result of that I'll say one name and you'll know it Bruce Jenner that's the argument of a liberal society amen there's no norms there's no morals there's no parameters you just do what you want to do with your life the end result is Bruce Jenner in fact he made the statement I am the new normal did you hear it did you hear it in the news in other words perversion violation of God's word wickedness is the new normal the sad thing is I think he's right in our society anything that's un godly is the norm. Anything that's unholy is the norm. Anything that's unrighteous is the norm. I'm going to tell you it may be that way with society, but it should never and will never be that way with the true blood washed church. of. If the, you are redeemed, the norm is righteousness. The norm is seeking God. The norm is walking in purity. Hallelujah! Bruce Jenner has become the poster child of pop culture in America. Follow the inclinations of your heart. Amen. Amen. Listen, people may not like it. I know you. I know this church. I know you're right with me this morning. Amen. But in many places, Christians do not like preaching like this. Amen. Well, just agree with me. Isn't that true? Amen. They will tell us there's a Christian generation that is turned off by the preaching you're hearing this morning. Church members have changed churches to avoid it. Popular preachers have substituted living holy for living prosperous. But none of that changes the fact that the Bible tells us that God's people live differently than the world around them. I want to tell you something. Jesus didn't just come to die for our sins. According to the scriptures, he died to save us from this present evil world. And if I'm living the life of the evil world, I've not been saved from it. Amen. And grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly. The other half of grace. And I want to bring this together Because Paul tells us one more thing. Grace teaches us how to live so we can be ready for the coming of Jesus. Look what he says in verse 13. We're looking for the blessed hope. How many can say amen? Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If there's any doubt in anybody's mind that Jesus is God, just read this verse. (laughs) Nowhere have we been told the Father's coming. We have been told Jesus is coming. And we're looking for the appearing of the great God. 
and our Savior. You know why grace is teaching us to live soberly, righteously, and godly? Grace is preparing us for the coming of Jesus Christ. How many has something turning in your heart? I want to be ready when, I, when he comes. Just a little bit about Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, not just past iniquity, but present iniquity. Amen. Music, would you, would, would you come? Whatever folks may say, I want to ask you the question. Can professed Christians live no differently than the world around them and honestly say that they are looking for the coming of Jesus? I mean, just honest, not, nobody else judging, just the, they themselves being the judge. Can they honestly say, live, say, I'm a Christian, live no differently than the world, lost world around them? Can they honestly then say, oh, I'm looking for Jesus to come? No. That's why grace is teaching. He's getting the people ready for his coming. Jesus went away to prepare us a place, but he sent grace and the Holy Spirit to prepare us for that place. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm glad to be saved by grace. But I'm glad grace didn't let me go right then. You know, I'm with the rest of you. I need grace this morning. Every one of us needs grace this morning. We either need grace to forgive us, or we need grace to help us and to teach us. And that's why I like to say, what James says. Listen to me, please. If you heard nothing else, he giveth more grace. Oh, it was a wonderful thing the day you got saved. And he gave you that undeserved favor. But how many times has grace talked to you? Grace has helped you. Grace kept you on the right road. Oh, hallelujah. You know, see, here in comes that humility. I don't care how long you serve God, how veteran you are. Not only can you not say, I was saved because I'm, I was so good or I tried so hard. You can't even say, I'm still saved because I'm so good and I tried so hard. If you're still saved this morning, you still have to say, it's grace. I had to learn some lessons. But if I was willing to listen... Grace taught me. Oh, hallelujah, what a teacher. Through many dangers, tools, and snares, we have already come. What brought us safe thus far? Grace. What's going to lead us all the way? And so I'm emphasizing, don't let anybody tell you. It's a message of legalism to say there's perimeters to our lives. There's things we do and we don't do. Don't let me tell you that's legalism. That's nothing more than grace. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Grace not only forgave us of our past life, grace gave us a whole new way of living. How many's found that true? Let me tell you just one story. I've kind of been bankrupt on stories this morning. Let me just tell you one. Egypt is largely Muslim today. And they got rules about classes of people. And if you're a good Muslim, one thing you'll never do is touch trash or go through trash or be a trash collector. And so in Cairo, every morning, 7,000 people live in a place called Garbage City on the dumps of Cairo. And every morning, 7,000 of them hitch up a cart to their horse and they go and collect people's trash that they put out on the, whatever they have, their curbs, the side of their house, the side of the road. They don't take the trash first to the dump. They take their trash to their little old shack where they're living. And they go through the trash looking for anything that has minutely some value, either in food value or material value every day. Then they pick out what they can. And what's left, they just take it and throw it in the dump. Living in shacks at a dump with the smell. Living with rags on their body. One day an older man, he picked up the trash in his cart. He went home and he was sifting through it. And he found a gold watch. This is in 1979. Worth $11,000.
He cleaned it up and looked, and inside there was inscribed a name, and he recognized it. It was a very wealthy young businessman in town. This garbage man, I don't know how he got to see this businessman, but he got to see him. And he said, sir, did you lose a watch? Yes, I did. And the garbage man handed the man the watch. The businessman did it. The garbage man did it. Everybody knew it. You don't do that if you're living like these people live. That, that, that would have changed his life forever. The, the garbage man, he could have sold that. The untouchable, the look down on. He, he could have had a lot of money. And he said, why? I'm so thankful you brought me my watch. But why did you do it? Let me read you direct what the man said. He said, because I'm a Christian. And he said, my Christ told me to be honest unto death. Do you hear what he did? He said, I did it because my Christ told me to. Wouldn't that be a wonderful, wouldn't that be a wonderful answer? I know I've been there. I, I, I went to school in the 60s and early 70s when short hair wasn't cool. I got called 50 kid about every day. And when I was cold my soul, they'd say, why, why do you got such short hair? Why don't you go to the movies? <laughs> I'd say, because my church says I shouldn't. Or my parents won't let me. That was before I really got prayed through. What about when folks say, why don't you do those things? Why don't you say, because grace that saved me. Grace said, don't do it. Wouldn't be, grace said, don't do it. That businessman said, I never thought about being Christian. I never wanted to be a Christian. But when that man walked out of my office, having returned my watch, because his Christ told him not to, he said, there must be something to this Christ. And he began to seek out, got gloriously saved, gave up his successful business, went to Bible school, became a minister, and built the church. Where? On the edge of the dump. To minister to garbage people. Don't snub up your nose to those garbage people. Every one of us, we're garbage people. Sin, tattered rags, undeserving of the grace of God. But he found us at the garbage heap. And he changed our lives. Let the world mock. Let the world make fun. Let the world say you're being ridiculous. You're being... No. You say, the grace that found me in the garbage dump is the grace that's speaking to me and talking to me. It's because of grace. You're just doing that because the church said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing that because grace saved me. Grace purified my heart and mind. I'm going to listen to grace. Would you stand across the building? If you're looking for the blessed hope, would you lift your hearts and hands and worship Him? Oh, hallelujah. You're here this morning. You're without Christ. This is the gospel. Hear me. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever your genetics, whatever your social upbringing, if you'll come to Christ calling on His name, grace, the favor of God, will take you in the arms of our Savior and make you born again, redeemed. If you've never been saved, you've got to get it. Every one of us had to get it. We don't deserve it. We're unworthy. But get this too. We cannot help ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot change ourselves. But if you would come and call on His name because of Calvary, amen, He'd give grace to save you. Anyone here need to be saved this morning? Amen. All across, all across the building, you need Jesus. You feel something tugging at your heart. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to feel I need Jesus. Are you here? Would you come right now? We use these steps for an altar. You need Jesus. Some of you, you've lived up into the years and you still don't have an assurance. You still don't have an assurance. Amen. You, you, you're, you're still beating yourself up. Amen. I want to tell you, give it to Jesus. Let grace take hold of you. Let grace come to you this morning and save you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
that altar a call is still open but I wonder right now for the rest of us is there anyone here that would just say just honestly maybe you haven't been but this morning you're going to say I'm going to listen to grace I'm going to quit listening to the other voices I'm going to listen to grace would you come and begin to fill this altar and say I'm going to listen to grace as grace teaches me I'm going to listen would you come and fill these altars I want to hear what grace says about living righteously and soberly and God because I want to be looking for amen that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity hallelujah oh what grace oh what grace that brings us out of sin oh but what grace that keeps us out of sin hallelujah hallelujah oh what grace it's not a hard thing it's not a heavy yoke it's the same grace that saved us it's the same wonderful acceptance of God it's the same wonder of favor of God this isn't a hard thing to stay away from the world it's something that's compelling our hearts oh the love of God Oh, there's a lot of synonyms for grace this morning. The mercy of God, the love of God, the kindness of God, the smile of God upon our lives, the inclusion of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. Let's have church. Amen. We're listening to grace. We're hearing grace. We're hearing grace. We're hearing grace. Grace is at work in the house. Come on, church. Just pray. Amen. Take my word for it and pray this morning. Grace is at work in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace brings us out. Grace keeps us out. Grace forgives us of our sin. Amen. Grace keeps us out of sin. Grace Grace gives us new life. Grace teaches us how to live. Hallelujah. Oh, He brought me out of the miry clay. Oh, but He keeps me out of the miry clay. Oh, call on His name. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. But it doesn't matter our past. It doesn't matter what we've done and how we've been. Amen. He'll save us this morning. He'll deliver us. He'll set us free. He'll cleanse our hearts. He'll cleanse our life. And oh, then He'll teach us a new way of living. Oh, He'll teach us to live above the snare. Live above the bondage. Live above the darkness. Live above that which would drag our soul. Oh, call upon His name. Call upon His name. Call upon His name. Amen. I want you to hear me all across this building. I'm not just talking about wicked things. But many of us across this building, we need more grace this morning. We need grace in our home relationships. We need grace at work. We need grace personally in a battle that we're fighting. We need grace for the temptation that's come upon us. We need grace for the trial that we're going through. Wherever you're at in the building, even would you just be honest across the building and say, God, I know I was saved by grace. But this morning, I need more grace. I need more grace. I need more grace. Hallelujah. Call on His name. Call on His name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, call on His name. You that have come, whether for salvation or any other reason, amen, earnestly call upon Him. Hallelujah. Call upon Him this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Call on His name. Oh, call on His name. You could wait a lifetime long. Call on His name. could not even The guilt of sin, you're only saved by grace. I'd worked so hard with my own strength. Church, let's try it. God's doing works of grace in the altar. Until he came to me and said your debt was canceled by the death of Calvary. He said to me, only grace, only grace grace can make you worthy.
he'll bring you out of the pit, but he'll keep you out of the pit. You don't have to live in the pit. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Will. 